Hear these words from select verses of John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are, we going to, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now that I am what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every, every one of you. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The, world of, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in college, I remember going on a, a, a retreat when there were students from all over the state of Indiana that were involved with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And we were uh, at Shackamack State Park in southern Indiana. There were about 150 to 200 students there. It was a, a great weekend, a great time of fellowship, a great time of learning. I remember that I had a notebook and I took all sorts of, of notes, but I really don't remember um, much about the notes that I took that day or that weekend. But what I do remember is something that happened at the very end of the retreat. It was the last session, you know, and, and following the, the last session, uh, they told us, okay, you know, this is kind of a low-budget retreat. Uh, we all need to pitch in and help to, to clean up. We were at a rustic area. We were in cabins and, and a conference center there at Shackamack State Park, but it was, was old facilities. And, uh, and so we were supposed to leave the facility in as good a shape as we found it or, or better. And so uh, they began reading a, a list of things that needed to be done. Each of the cabins needed to be cleaned out. The, the conference center needed to be uh, torn down and, and straightened up. And restrooms needed to, to be cleaned. And, and there were a, a whole list of, of items. But when they said the restrooms needed to be cleaned, I thought, oh, not that. You know, they weren't in that great a shape when we arrived. And then for a whole weekend, 150 to 200 people using them, you know, that was not the thing that I wanted to do. I was willing to do anything else on the list, but I thought, I don't want to be assigned or I don't want to be volunteered to, to do the restrooms. So they went through the, the whole list of items, and then they said, okay, do we have any volunteers for any of the items? And I remember a guy that, that eagerly threw his hand up in the air, and he said, we'll do the restrooms. And it was a, a group of guys from, from Rose Hallman that, that volunteered to, to do the restrooms that day. And you know, I, I remember kind of a, a sigh of relief on the one hand, but, but also maybe just a little bit of guilt. Because these guys were willing to, to humble themselves and to do what they knew that no one else was willing to do. They were living out what it meant to, to make a sacrifice and to be humble servants. Jesus was gathered with his disciples in the upper room for, for the Passover feast. He knew that uh, in just a few hours he would be arrested. He knew that in less than 24 hours he would be crucified. Verse 1 says that Jesus showed his disciples the full extent of his love. Well, how did he show the, the full extent of his love? First of all, in the passage that was read, he, he showed the full extent of his love by, by humbling, humbling himself as a servant and, uh, and showing you know, his disciples what it meant to, to serve. Secondly, um, 
You know, Jesus was teaching his disciples uh, what it meant to, uh, to follow in, in God's ways. And also, um, he was about to, to give of his, his life. He was about to give of his life as a, as a sacrifice for, uh, for the sins of, of the world by dying on the cross. Now, the way we show our love for, for others is through, through humble service, to, by teaching them God's truth. Now, Jesus came with a, with a specific mission. He came into this world you know, with the assignment of, of dying on the cross for, for the sins of the world. None of us have that, that assignment. None of us have, have been sent to, to lay our life down as, as Jesus did. But yet, you know, we can show the, the extent of our love you know, in following Jesus' example, who, who gave up his rights, gave up for what he deserved. He laid down his, his life for, for others. And so we can, can give up our own rights, our own desires, for the sake of another person. The way Jesus showed the extent of his love was in, uh, in humble service was by washing the disciples' feet. Now, Jesus was the last person in the upper room that should have been washing feet that day. You know, the job of washing someone's feet was the, the job of a, of a servant. It was, was not the, you know, it was not the, the job of, of the, the teacher. You know, there were practical aspects to, uh, to foot washing. You know, the streets were dusty and people wore sandals uh, without any sort of socks. And so as they came in, their feet were dusty and dirty. And, and it was just, uh, it, it was the thing to do to, to wash their feet. It, it was actually a breach of hospitality to not uh, make provision to have someone's feet washed as they arrived as a guest in your home. Well, as we've seen in in recent passages that, that we've been preaching on on Sunday morning, that there, there's often a, a conflict, there's, there's often a, a, a strain between the, the situation at hand and, and who Jesus is interacting with, what their interaction or what their understanding is of what they're talking about, and then there's also what Jesus is trying to, to convey. Remember the woman at the well? You know, she was talking about uh, having a, a drink of water, you know, having physical water, but, but Jesus was talking to her about quenching a, a spiritual thirst. Jesus was talking to her um, about uh, having her spiritual thirst quenched by, uh, by the, the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about Nicodemus. You know, and Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about being born again, and, and Nicodemus, all he could think about was, you mean I got to go back in my mother's womb and, and be born again? But Jesus was talking about a, a spiritual birth or a spiritual rebirth. You know, in this case, there, there was practical application of, of needing, the, the disciples needing to have their, their feet washed, but, but it was more than that. Jesus wasn't talking just of, about, about washing their feet, but rather he, um, he was also demonstrating humble service to them. He was saying to, to Peter, unless you let me wash your sins away, you can have no part of me. In verse 7, Jesus said to, to, to Peter, you don't realize what I'm doing now, but in time you will understand. Like many from the, the pages of Scripture, we don't always understand what's going on in the moment. We often see the, the need for a drink or, or the, the need for, for feet to be being washed, but we don't necessarily see the, the bigger picture of what God may be doing or, or what God may be wanting to teach us. In the days of COVID-19, there's lots of stress and fears and anxiety. And, and from a human perspective, those are reasonable responses to what's going on in in, in our culture. And it's so easy to be consumed by, by those emotions. But I'm a person of faith. And I believe that, that God's plan, God's hand in this world is, is bigger than I can comprehend or, or understand. I, I believe that uh, God 
has a bigger picture in mind. And so as I get so focused upon the, the fears that are being bombarded with me in, in the world, I, I've got to, to consciously recognize that God is in control and I can trust him even when I don't know how things are, are going to turn out. I believe that our God is bigger than any problems we might face. If I truly believe that, then what do I have to fear? If I truly believe that, what do I have to, to be anxious about? In a recent presentation I was watching about the, the children of Israel and crossing the Red Sea, you remember that, that story as, as Moses w- was leading them in, in the desert. They, they came to, to the Red Sea, and, and it was like they had, had come to a, a dead end because there was this body of water in front of them, and Pharaoh's army was be- behind them, and, and they w- were pinned in from both sides. What would, what would they do? And there seemed to be no way. God made a way. God parted the Red Sea, and, and, and they walked through. Maybe we need to begin looking at our stresses and struggles that we face from the perspective of, of faith, looking for how it is that, that God is at work or, or looking for God to, to be at work rather than feeling helpless because we're not in control. When Peter refused to let Jesus wash his feet, it was his pride speaking. If It it may have been Peter's desire to to be in in control. It may have been Peter's desire to, to, to control that situation. But Jesus said to him, unless you you unless you let me wash you, you can have no part of me. When Jesus is finished washing the disciples' feet, he, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done for you? Well, the answer to that was no. You know, as in most cases, they, they realized that he had washed the dust off their feet, but they, they didn't uh, comprehend the, the full scope of what it was that, that Jesus had done for them. So he explains it to them. He, he said, it, it's right for you to call me teacher and, and Lord, because that's who I am. And according to, to the order of this world, a, a teacher or a master, they should never wash their their disciples or never wash their, uh, their students' feet, that, that's beneath them. According to, to the order of this world, that was not something that, that Jesus should do. But he said, I have now set an example for you that you should, should serve one another. You should do what, what I've done. Jesus tells them that they should wash one another's feet. Now, he's not not just talking about washing feet. He, he's talking about more than that. He's talking about humbly serving others. And, and not only that, he's talking about some humbly serving those who um, you might think should be serving you. In verse 17, Jesus says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus didn't say you would be blessed if you know these things. He said, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you put them into practice, if you do what, what you've learned. So what does it mean for us to be a humble servant? What job do you think is beneath you? Who do you think should be serving you? What rights do you demand? Jesus gave up his rights in order to serve. And then he had the gall to tell his disciples, to tell those who would follow after him that they should do the same thing. So as Brian's already kind of covered a little bit of the sermon today, talking about this radical uncommon love that Jesus called us to with the the washing of the disciples' feet, right? Jesus is trying to teach the disciples something. And as usual, they don't get it, um, which, you know, we can't, we can't relate to that at all, right? We, we understand everything we're taught immediately the first time. Um, so Jesus, after Judas leaves the room, he decides to tell them again in a different way what he's trying to say. And this is in verse uh, 34 and 35. It says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love 
one another. Now, we, uh, we misappropriate this text a little bit. See, we act like this is a, a call to just love one another, man. Just, just agree to disagree. Let's just, you know, you do you and I'll do me and we'll be okay because, you know, we love one another. But when we misappropriate what Jesus is saying, we often miss the point. We often miss the entire aspect of what Jesus is doing here. And it's important that we look at the words he says carefully. You see, he says first, a new command I give you. You might not be familiar with the term command, but in the Old Testament, that was kind of a big deal, right? The Ten Commandments. Jesus is saying this number 11, amendment, a new command I give you. And what Jesus is doing in this new command is he's changing some very fundamental aspects of the Old Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, um, in the, the Shema, which is a, a fundamental Jewish teaching that parents are supposed to teach their children this thing. This is the, uh, the foundation of, of Judaism for them, um, that you're supposed to teach all your kids so they can understand everything else. And that is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You guys have heard this before, right? This is the, the standard teaching. But with that teaching... The love you have for your neighbor, the variable it's dependent on, is the love you have for yourself. And let's be honest, we're, we're a fickle people. We, uh, we fluctuate how much we love ourselves. Right? Like today you could be like, I'm looking really good. I love myself today. This is nice. And then tomorrow you're like, who is this, this monster in the mirror? Right? You could, you could change a little bit of how you view yourself and also, you can change how you view yourself based upon the situation. You can, you can justify things on how you view yourself. So if you're loving your neighbor based upon how you view yourself, you can say, well, look, I worked hard for what I have. They didn't work hard, so I don't need to show them love. They didn't do what I did. Because we base the whole variable of our love for our neighbor upon our own constraints and the own way that we're supposed to go about things. It's all on us. But Jesus says, a new command I give you. Uh, a new, that, that new term is not a new like, oh, look, I have a new tie. It's a, it's a new, all of encompassing, kind of the term you use when you go from the, post the pre-internet age to the post-internet age type of new. This changes everything. And Jesus makes the variable for how we're supposed to love one another, him. Love one another as I have loved you, you must love one another. So the thing we're basing our love now is not on how much we love ourselves, it's how much Jesus loved us, and the bar gets considerably higher for all of us. This love that Jesus has for us is the kind of love we talk about, right? Because it's, it's reckless. It's never-ending. It's, it's love that meets us where we are, not a place we have to go to. It's, it's something that sacrifices. This love is, is different. So when we change the variable for what love looks like, how we're required to be people of love, because they will know you, as my disciples, if you love one another, changes. This, this shift happens, and it's not a natural shift. It's completely unnatural. You see in the, in the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, right? Jesus, you know, takes his robe off, and he gets his towel on, and he gets his bowl, and he walks up. And there are 12 guys in the room. And by about God, too, you kind of figure out what Jesus is doing, Right? The first one, you're like, oh, what's, what's going on? Maybe he just thought, you know, that, that James had some nasty feet and he wanted to clean those off, but now he, he's going on to the zealot. Is he going to wash all of our feet? And in that moment, not a single disciple said, Jesus, I got this one. Let me take over for you, Big J. Let me, let me grab the bowl and the towel, and I'll, I'll take it from here. I kind of get the point. Not a single disciple Stepped in. Because it's unnatural. It's not something you do. It's feet. 
right? <laughs> We're not big fans of our own feet. We pay people to clean our feet. And yet not a single person stepped in for Jesus. See, this unnatural, this unconditional love that is shown by Jesus can only come through the power of God. This love is called grace. This, this love that comes from God into the world, it's God's interaction with the world, this grace that comes. That is the love that Jesus is showing to his disciples. He says, look, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And that's who I want you to be, is people who serve one another. You see, when we, we live this contrary type love, this not normal, this uncommon, this radical type love. We're living into the way the kingdom of God is supposed to be. We're supposed to be people of grace. And not just people that sing about grace, but people that live through grace. That God's grace comes into the world through us. That the world would see God because of how we love one another. Let's be honest, Christians that really known for their, their love right now haven't been for a while. We're mostly known by what we're against, not what we're for. And I haven't heard the term grace used to describe any people group in a really long time. But this is how we're meant to be in the kingdom of God together, to love one another together, to show this type of love. And when we see grace lived out, in that moment is when we see the kingdom of God. And that's when things change. I, um, I had a mission trip when I was in, in a junior in high school. We went to Chicago, and I was a pretty good kid. Um, didn't really get in a lot of trouble growing up. And our youth group, I loved it. We were a pretty large youth group, super close-knit. And we decided we wanted to be heathens on this mission trip. Absolute heathens. You see... There were some relationship things. A girl broke up with a boy and then started dating another boy on the, on the ride up to Chicago. <laughs> if you're not familiar with youth, this happens quite a bit. Um, and so there was a little, uh, little infighting there, a little bit of, you know, I'm going to beat you up kind of stuff. No one ever did. Uh, we were just super rude and mean to each other the entire time. Worship was not real. Uh, we would get very cliquish in how we were serving. It was not going well on day two. But the night of day two, things took a, a bad turn. You see, my friend Brandon, he had brought a laser lighter, a laser light, you know, like the little beam of light. We were on the third floor of the, um, the Salvation Army building. That's where we were staying at. And we thought it would be a really cool idea to shine that laser light on people at the subway station. Just to shine on them to think, to think there was a sniper, right? This was in 2005. There were some issues with snipers around that time. Um, and we thought this was hilarious. The police of Chicago did not, the CPD. They were not big fans of us. So they came to the Salvation Army building, knocked on the door, and Jason, my youth pastor, went downstairs. He answered the door and was like, hi. And we, we saw the lights. We can do math and recognized we were in trouble. So Jason comes up from this meeting with the cops and he says, okay, 10 minutes, we're going to have a meeting in this room, be there. And all of us are like, yep, we're about to get it. It's, it's about to go down, right? We're about to get yelled at. Um, he's, he's, our, he's not our parent, so he's a pastor, so he can't beat us physically. But he can definitely like yell at us and guilt us and do those type of things, right? That's, what, that's the tools available to a youth pastor. And most of us grew up in, in a single parent or split home, so we're kind of used to that whole verbal you know, lashing things. So, okay, we're going to go in here, we're going to get yelled at. And it's going to be a really awful trip, and we deserve it, that's fine. We'll go do that together. So we come into this room, and there's a circle of chairs. And he says, take a seat. We're like, okay, cool. So we take a seat, you know, he's going to yell at us in the round. This is going to be great. And then he tells us to take off our shoes and our socks. And I was like, maybe he doesn't want us to run. Maybe that's the option, Right? And he gets a bowl, and he starts, there's to my left four people, and he begins to wash our feet, person by person by person. And very quickly, 
the tears on the floor was more than the water in the bowl. I remember when he washed my feet. Not being able to look him in the eye. And as he told me, he told every person, I love you because Christ loves you. And I do this to show you the love of Christ. And in that moment, grace became real to me. And I knew that Jason was a disciple of Christ by his love. Also, way more effective than yelling. Because the rest of that trip, we became a people who loved one another. All because Pastor Jason was willing to wash the feet of his disciples, of the youth who were, who were learning under him, and to show grace in a situation he shouldn't have. And he didn't have to. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When we show grace to each other, the world will know. When we choose grace first, the world will know because the world always knows when there's something different happening. When there's something that's not planned, something that's not with the norm, things change and the world knows. Could you imagine if we became a people known by our uncommon love? Not because we wash feet, but because we always choose to be the grace of God to other people. When have you experienced uncommon love? When have you experienced a radical love that showed you the grace of God? When have you served someone in that way? Or when have you been served in that way where you knew this person is doing this or I'm doing this solely because of the love of God? Friends, the kingdom of God requires us to make the grace of God the new normal. Can we be that people? Let's pray. God of grace, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that you said because you know you are blessed. But God, I also know because we know we are challenged. And your Holy Spirit will challenge us this week to be people of grace. God, give us the courage to accept the challenge so that the world may know us by our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.